Hi everyone, welcome to week four. Um, today we keep going with our uh, overview of a transnational network through this idea of visual culture. And I've chosen the social network to really um, use it as, as an entry point to talk about a new type of power, which is the power of what I will be calling technologic and this new technology um, infrastructure and power industry uh, that is basically ruling uh, our lives today. So to talk about that, um, I, I, I will be using a feminist approach. And I think if, if you already watch a social network, um, one of the things that really stand out is um, the little role that women have uh, in the film. And I don't think that is by chance. Um, I think a lot can be said um, about directors um, lack of um, awareness perhaps, but I, um, I think it's, it's, it's more important to think about the role of women in the film really as a, as the entry point to understand male power structures. And to understand male power structures is really to understand power structures today. So that's why I think feminist theory is really helpful uh, when approaching this transnational um, subject. Uh, because the the really the difference between uh, different type of feminist movements, which are contingent, and that means they're context bound at different levels. They're context bound at the political level, at the historical level, sometimes at the social level, right? The difference between that feminist movement that deals with different gender inequities and feminist theory is that feminist theory is really a theory of power, okay? So while the feminist movement can be said, especially to be historically contingent in the way that social movements have theorized about it, uh, in that these different type of movements of feminist movements and or feminist waves, uh, they revolve around the idea of resource mobilization. So how much resources can I mobilize to achieve a particular political goal, hence political advocacy. And those are feminist movements. And within feminist movements, there is um, an academic uh, strain that has to do with feminist theory that goes beyond particular or contingent aspirational policies that are advocated by different feminist movements of waves. And if we understand feminism as a political theory that deals with historical power imbalances, as well as their long lasting, and here I emphasize long lasting structures in male dominated society, then it will be very useful to understand the world uh, in which we enter after uh, through watching uh, the social network, the film, the social network, right? Um, so to, to put it in another way and, and, and to wrap up this um, very brief approach to feminist theory, really the idea of feminist theory is that it unveils different type of patriarchal structures. And these patriarchal structures are nothing less and nothing more than forms of power. And when I say power, I'm talking about government and any other type of institutional power and knowledge, which, in, it, which it really in here resides in the power of a culture and, and different social norms. And so those forms of powers that are reproduced as well as produced through these male dominated power structures or what is also could be also referred to as masculinist networks. That is networks in which in, in which being a man, it's always an advantage to maintain power.
right? So the social network, I emphasize, is a window and a, I think a very telling window that allow, allow us to reflect on how that global form of power that we see, the technologic that I will be talking about later in the lecture, has changed from traditional forms of masculine power into a new form of masculine power in the 21st century. What I will be referring to as a macho type of power from the gig type of power. So before we get into the details of um, what the social network, the film represents and how to understand this new form of power, uh, I want you to, to pay attention to to me, is one of the most interesting scholars on feminism, and especially her take on feminist theory and her, her understanding of feminist theory uh, beyond uh, feminist movements and their fight for gender e uh, equality, and uh, their expo the ex and also exposing beyond exposing gender inequality. So Sarah Med look at feminist theory as location, and here location is really a technical world uh, word or term uh, and that looks at power. So I'm going to play a little bit of Sarah Ahmed when and her take on feminist theory and then I'll, I'll comment a little bit more on on her take. Feminism is about trying to change the world. Mm -hmm. It's about recognizing gender inequalities, but other inequalities as well. My work is concerned with trying to get better understandings of how power operates, so we can have a better chance at intervening in those power relations, so that people have more room in their lives to live in accordance with their wishes. It's often um, power works through um, presuming that the interests of one group are the interests of all groups mm -hmm. and that usually works by hiding that these are the interests of one group as opposed to all groups so that when one person speaks it seems it, it appears that they're speaking for everybody when actually they're only speaking for somebody so when we're um, trying to challenge universalism we're actually trying to show that actually what's at stake is the power of who's speaking mm -hmm. who gets to speak who gets to say what matters for people for a particular group who gets to represent that group's interests in politics and in everyday life. So it's a question of putting the who back into politics. Somebody speaking, not everybody speaking. Somebody's working, not everybody's working. So you're always thinking about trying to locate the person who is doing the knowledge, who is writing the books, who is giving the speech, and recognise that their location matters, and it often matters by being disappearing from viewpoint. So we actually say where you come from, who you are, the history that you have in coming to this world, that shapes what you can do and we need to explore that. It was a, a starting point for feminists, was to challenge universalism. And what that means was basically to show how when people assume something to be universally relevant about everybody, they were actually referring to a specific group of people. So when they were talking about human rights, they were referring to men's rights. Or when they were talking about humanity, they were referring to, uh, to white people. Mm -hmm. So what we do when we do a critique of universalism is we show it that actually the universal is quite particular. It universalises from one particular group as if what stands for them stands for everyone. And that's what we need to explode. Right, so precisely what we are going to be doing here today is challenging that type of implied universalism that comes with um, this male-dominated industry and in the that you can see in the social network by looking at the particulars that are assumed in that form of power. It's a form of power that uh, takes for granted many uh, many other uh, ways in which uh, not only society but, but 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 politics and economics work in, in in that it's these other aspects are not only made invisible in in that they're they're always put to the side they are never give any prominent role 
But it's more than that. That is an indication that that type, those type of spaces, those locations don't matter. Those locations don't matter. And the location of power that you see when you watch a social network, that is taken implicitly, implicitly as universal. And the very specific example that I'll be using at this point to challenge that implicit universalism is this idea of the myth uh, male of the myth uh, of the myth of the male genius of the of the mad scientist that we can see in the figure of um, Mark Zuckerberg in the film that that the stroke of genius to create this new type of power structure by one individual and that it's not only a myth but it's a symbol it's a symbol of how power works power works through male individualization remember the last week we were talking about when you think about revolutionary who you think about right you think about Che Guevara you think about Lenin you think about Martin Luther King you never think about the Rosa Luxemburg right never think about Emma Goldman never think about you don't know the picture of Rosa Parks. So this is what I'm implying. I'm locating power via Sarah Metz feminist theory and looking at how power relationships work. I'm putting the who back into politics and locating the power in this male dominated industry within the power structure that is economics and politics at large. And through that, we'll see how this new form of global power is really the continuation of hegemonic masculinity. A he hegemonic masculinity that, as we will see, has changed, but it is still hegemonic masculinity, i.e. male power structures. So I think an interesting point to make to uh, and in relation to um, these male power structures and the different visibility and invisibility um, dynamics that are at play is going far to a faraway land in Argentina and to a, a completely different epoch in the 19th century. Um, and in the spirit of, of a transnational or having a transnational approach, I think looking at Sarmiento's uh, uh, very famous, especially in Latin America, Civilization and Barbarism, that's her book, um, in the 19th century, uh, will um, make us understand how that type of rationality is a type of male power structure that type of rationality embedded in civilization of um, barbarism uh, really stems from a vision that was, that's been present at least since enlightenment, at least in the enlightenment, especially in the peak of the enlightenment era in the 19th century and rational thought, right? So Sarmiento um, was a 19th century, journalist, writer, and intellectual from Argentina. He was the second president of Argentina. And he wrote this book, Civilization of Barbarism, uh, in which right after the, uh, the uh, independence of the country from the Spanish empire, he adopts a new colonial vision, a neo-colonial vision of the Argentinian nation. And this neo-colonial vision is based in the inherent superiority of Eurocentric an enlightenment thought. That is the great figures of the enlightenment from European, uh, what, of European tradition, like Descartes, Locke, Kant, Rousseau, um, and Hume, and all the rest, are, will, will help uh, civilization to be expanded to the barbaric parts, i.e. the indigenous lands, of Argentina, that that expansion is what makes a, a country civilized and a nation a nation, right? And this take, this 
neo-colonial take uh, because it was an inner expansion. It was the, the, uh, the expansion of the Argentinian nation as a concept, but also uh, as, a, as, a ge as the geography of the country expanding south into indigenous uh, unoccupied lands. Um, that was based on the idea of the superiority of rationality and and this super that and this this then creates this hyper rational myth that gives way to the genius myth to the leader to the to the political leader that know that that knows best uh, um, that that knows how to lead their nation that a nation uh, that leader on, on on which the nation relies to prosper right and and this could go from political leaders, but it goes to you know mythical literary figures like Sherlock Holmes, which is the pinnacle of rationality, doesn't need violence, but only logic deduction and and uh, and just um, inherent genius uh, to solve all type of problems, right? And from that, from that, that line that goes from the Enlightenment to Sarmiento's to the genius myth to Sherlock Holmes, from that we recreate, we are recreating really, if we deconstruct what is happening uh, with the idea of technocratic ruling. That's how we justify technocratic ruling. A technocratic ruling, it's simply the rule of those who are the most qualified technicians in government, i.e. what you really need in government, it's someone who knows how to best deal with this specific uh, specific technical issue. And that's something that is completely assumed. Uh, um, we don't think, uh, because if we really take it apart and so, so pick it apart and deconstruct that idea of technocracy, that those who knows the most about fiscal policy are the best ones to uh, produce uh, tax, tax legislation. Um, it's really a non secretary that, that, that it doesn't follow that you know that just because you know a lot about fiscal policy, you, you will govern the best when it comes to creating tax legislation for your country. It just means that you are adopting a certain type of really invisible ideology that comes with your knowledge. Uh, because again, knowledge is not neutral. Knowledge is always um, has some type of power structure embedded in it. Uh, you know something because you've been taught how to know something. And it, there's always, and there is always a bias within your knowledge, right? So that's why we need checks and balances when it comes to the application of knowledge in government. Uh, my approach needs to be balanced against um, someone else's take or approach. That's why we have democracies. Otherwise, we wouldn't need democracies, right? We just need people who know how to manage the state, right? So this myth is really based off that hyper-rationality that those who knows best in terms of their technocratic rulings, in terms of the, the techniques to govern or to expand it, any type of knowledge, those are the ones who uh, will, uh, will belong to the elites, who will populate the elites. And in the latest stage of this, um, train of thought, it's this neoliberal fetishization of technologic in the 21st century, uh, and which is that myth that create how are techno elites, uh, the, the CEOs of Amazons, Teslas, Facebook, Google, Apple, how are these geniuses that it, that really not only know how to uh, create innovation and companies that rule the world, but they are at the forefront of how the world should be, which 
implies that they will be the best leaders anyone could be if you really push the argument to its limits, right? And and in this this um, type of technocratic rule, if we follow Ahmed's reasoning and we deconstruct what type of rational mandate are these uh, means uh, uh, propagating, what we realize is that within all those, within that technologic, really a type of masculinity is always at the center. And it's a masculinity that has been hegemonic since, since the enlightenment and the, the myth of the, of the seat of the rational man. And this is what Yanis Varoufakis has called the techno feudal lord. So he called it techno feudalism, this latest part of this techno capitalist vision of how to govern society, right? So another term for this, um, which is the other, the other, in the other coin of this techno logic, uh, is, is the idea of liquid capitalism. And, and technology can be produced and this hyper-rationality that is embedded in this hegemonic in masculinity. This is possible because we live in a stage of, cap of capitalism that is liquid, that is disem disembodied, that is not material. And if you look at the evolution of capitalism, very roughly, of course, uh, you see that in our current stage, which can be called as a neoliberal stage, which roughly comes from the 80s uh, until today, perhaps um, we don't know if it's, if we could, there's some economic historians who argue that really this stage is finished uh, by 2011 after the GFC, um, at, but at least very, at, until very recently, it, we're, it's it's too it's too early to really be able to look back and and know the different stages when the stage has ended. We need a little bit more of distance. But in any case, if you look at the evolution of capitalism and that rational that the rational that uh, that produces this technologic this hyper rationality embodied in embedded sorry in 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 hegemonic masculinity. You look, you, you realize that we go from um, a money power balance that went from being material, in which basically you were selling consumer goods in markets, to being almost material, so abstract that what we what value now is simply projections of really of extremely rapid value exchange, exchanges in the stock market. Um, and the materiality of that exchange is basically gone. And in parallel, what we have is how that symbol of the macho cowboy Marlboro company boss of traditional consumer good capitalism has, was has evolved and is being eventually replaced to the subdued masculinity of the mad genius. Both of them are hyper rational men, but this new subdue or so-called subdue masculinity now comes along with a new era of the internet, right? And, and here I'm quoting, uh, as the internet and other technologies have expanded, so has the power of white middle-class masculinities based around rationality and their role in legitimating our gender and virginity that is our current male power structure, then if we think about techno-feudal lords, we think about Elon Musk, Zuckerberg, Jeff Bezos, right? That's what we're thinking about. And I know that the idea of techno-feudalism, uh, it might sound as a caricature, um, but the amount of power that these people hold uh, it's really akin to a feudal system. It's really akin to a feudal system. I don't think it's an exaggeration, but that might be besides the point. What I'm trying to really point here is how 
this technology has evolved but maintained the trait of hegemonic masculinity. Has evolved but maintain, maintained the trait of hegemonic masculinity. And has evolved precisely because the type of capitalism that we have today, it's liquid, it's immaterial, it's disembodied. It's a type of power that has no body. Yeah. So this is very, um, very obvious in the social network. And I think it's such a good film precisely to look at that and how this hegemonic masculinity, it's simply a new type of power rationality, right? And that's why I think we need to go, when we look at the social network, there is this very stark um, opposition between the Winklevoss twins and then Mark Zuckerberg. And we have two different types of masculinities, but what we have in here is not the jocks versus the gigs. Um, what we have here is a new type of power rationality, a new type of power rationality. So I'm going to play these two scenes back to back, and then I'll do a little commentary on them to basically drive the point home. So you can see their figures, their um, mus muscular, uh, all money types of Harvard. Think about that and think how almost car caricature like they are when compared to the new power, the new power rationality that I'm going to show you in, in, the, in the character of Mark Zuckerberg. I'm not going to do the farm animals, but I like the idea of comparing two people together. It gives the whole thing a very Turing feel, since people's ratings of the pictures will be more implicit than, say, choosing a number to represent each person's hotness like they do on hotornot.com. The first thing we're going to need is a lot of pictures. Unfortunately, Harvard doesn't keep a public centralized Facebook, so I'm going to have to get all the images from the individual houses that people are in. Let the hacking begin. Kirkland. They keep everything open and allow indexes in their Apache configuration, so a little W get magic is all that's necessary to download the entire Kirkland Facebook. Kid stuff. is Elliot. They're also open, but with no indexes on Apache. I can run an empty search and it returns all the images in the database in a single page. And I can save the page and Mozilla will save all the images for me. Oh, he does. Excellent. Moving right along. Excuse me. 
Excuse me, everybody. You are at one of the oldest, one of the most exclusive clubs, not just at Harvard, but in the world. And I want to welcome you all to Phoenix Club's first party of the fall semester. <laughs> some security. They require a username password combo and I'm gonna go ahead and say they don't have access to the main FAS user database so they have no way of detecting an intrusion. Adams has no security but limits the number of results to 20 a page. All I need to do is break out the same script I used on Lowell and we're set. Quincy has no online Facebook. What a sham. Nothing I can do about that. Dunster is intense. Not only is there no public directory, but there's no directory at all. You have to do searches, and if your search returns more than 20 matches, nothing gets returned. And once you do get results, they don't link directly to the images, they link to a PHP that redirects or something. Weird. This may be difficult, I'll come back later. Hey, Shark Week's on. What? Great boy, beautiful fish. Thanks. Chris. Leverett is a little better. They still make you search, but you can do an empty search and get links to pages with every student's picture. It's slightly obnoxious that they only let you view one picture at a time, and there's no way I'm going to go to 500 pages to download pics one at a time. So it's definitely necessary to break out Emacs and modify that Perl script. So think about this in these two, two scenes in terms of access and exclusive access. Who has access now? Uh, you can see the all institutions of power that gives you access are overridden by just one voice, the voice of this quote unquote mad genius that is hacking and having access to all these different houses and connecting them together and ruling over them. So this symbol of power is a new symbol of had a new sim it's a new symbol, it it's a new type of power that it's really on asteroids. It's the old type of power, the old hegemonic masculinity, the old cowboy, macho, muscular figure uh, represented by the Winkle bosses is now evolved into the mad genius of Matt Zuckerberg, right? And access now is not needed through being in one place. In fact, access now is not achieved by being in one place. Access now is achieved by being everywhere and nowhere at the same time. That is what the social network is about. Right? So it's a type of disembodied power. And then you can see it at really at the, in the introduction of Mendix's article, right? How basically what I'm saying is really the same type of hegemonic masculinity. Right, uh, it's not the successful, the successor. It's a, the new evolution of the same thing, the new evolution of, a, of of male of a male power structure. It's a new type of power rationality in that it has evolved from the same idea of the hyper rational man, uh, the hyper rational man. Uh, that was a, a way to create a power structure. That evolution, got it's, it's now embodied in this disembodied type of power, you know, um, it, it, in this paradox that is the social network. Because remember, it's a paradox because power now it's at the same time immaterial in that it's in the ether, in the internet, that the value is not connected to something material, to a product, but it's very material in that it rules all of our lives, uh, our thinking, our policy, uh, the way we relate to each other, right? Um, so in the end, we're looking at a type of male power structure that is all about managing tiny lives, as Schreiber uh, argues in the article. Um, and these tiny lives are this embodied life, lives that do not have a body on the internet. And at the same time, the paradox and the tension is that they do actually have a body. It's just like the consequences, the material consequences of those bodies uh, that are the product of managing this disembodied tiny life 
are completely irrelevant to this techno logic. This technology is looking at the managing of this disembodied people, these tiny lives in which in that we are we are pawns to be techno managed from the top, right? Um, so we now become the commodity and we are paradoxical in that we are on one hand ethereal, they're abstract, they're we are data, we are our personal data, and on the other, we're very much bodies, real people. But this bodily side of us is not what gives value to the suckerbirds, right? To those techno lords at the top. Right. So here comes the paradox. And that's why it's important to understand hege this hegemonic masculinity, not just as a, you know, a, as a, as a male dominated industry in that this, all these new companies have a problem with, you know, women and, uh, and, and the social networks have a problem uh, with gender. It's, it's not only that, it's that it's a very specific type of power. It's a very specific type of power that is derived from the conception of hegemonic masculinity that at the same time derived from the conception of rationality, right? So it, there is this domino effect that creates a new type of power rationality, right? And, and that's why, you know, uh, Emily Chan has called Silicon Valley a brotopia. And she calls it, and I think this is useful, not so much because of the nitty gritty uh, of the of Silicon Valley's problem, women problem, so-called women problem, but because it's an example precisely of how power works in masculinist networks how it's really an extension of that hegemonic masculinity that before this new iteration had to do with the, uh, with the macho Marlboro cowboy, before that has to do with the hyper-rational leader that is never emotional taking in, in his decision-making, has to do with the justification for uh, colonial enterprises, uh, the justification for uh, different type of uh, Western expansions, the, justif the justification for hierarchy, the hierarchies of knowledge. Yeah. So in this domino, connected dominoes of uh, that it is male power structures, Brotopia is the later iteration. So let's hear out just a couple of minutes of Emily Chang. Uh, just as a basically uh, 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 as, a, as an older example of what um, of the location of power that Ahmed what uh, Ahmed was talking about at the very beginning of the lecture. There's kind of this blurring between professional and personal lives in Silicon Valley, and you're right, they've changed the world in so many ways, but they've also amassed so much money. And how does that play into these meetings that are happening outside of the office? So much business in Silicon Valley gets done outside the office. So we are talking about the party, the bar, the hotel lobby, the conference, maybe it's the hot tub. In a lot of situations, women are being put in uncomfortable positions where they're not able to be their best selves. And I've spoken to so many women who've said, I don't want to get into a hot tub and pitch investors my business while holding a beer. What woman wants to do that while wearing a bikini? A lot of the times, it's their male managers that are, that are inviting them out, and they're faced with this sort of catch-22. Do I go and be part of the team? Of course they're going to talk about work. Or do I stay and be that uncool kid and, you know, not get that opportunity? You spoke to a lot of women who had this experience, but then there has been some backlash, especially from big names like Elon Musk came out and said, this was salacious and you should be ashamed for misleading the public. How do you respond to that kind of criticism? So I understand this is new territory to cover and to connect with this issue, but no good change comes without some people feeling a little uncomfortable. And I've spoken to over three dozen people who either they've been to these parties or they felt shut out by these parties, both men 
and women. Mm -hmm. And in a lot of ways, they're a lot less about sex and a lot more about power, and the power dynamic is completely lopsided. Are there companies that are getting it right? What are the companies to follow? I talk about Slack, which is uh, the focus of the last chapter of my book. Stuart Butterfield, the CEO, has said, this is important to me. He's put a stake in, it, in the ground and it's showing in the numbers. I also think that just having women in leadership position, it organically creates diversity. I talk about Eventbrite, where Julia Hartz is um, co-founder and, and now the CEO, and they're 50-50, and she said it just happened. Same with Rent the Runway. In fact, Rent the Runway is actually 70% women and minorities. Dick Costolo, the former CEO of Twitter, told me that he wouldn't hire another man until he'd hired a woman. Jack Dorsey is doing something really interesting at Square. When they bring a new woman on the engineering team, they put her on a team with other women, which means that there are some teams that remain all male, but it allows that woman to bond with other women and network. And then once she has that support system, they move them around to different parts of the organization. It's an experiment. But the discrimination in Silicon Valley is systemic and it has seeped into the culture. This is an industry that is controlling what we see, what we read, how we shop. It's making the video games that our children are playing and the social media that everyone is using. These companies are making products that are used by billions and billions of people and we don't think about who's actually behind the scenes, but in fact, it's probably the most powerful industry in the world and it's changing the way we live. Men can't be making all the decisions in Silicon Valley by themselves. Okay, so here is the problem of this male-dominated industry is not only that it's male-dominated. The key here is to understand that this male-dominated -dominate, industry follows a logic of hegemonic masculinity that it's an all-power male structure that is born in rationality, hyper-rationality, that follows a technologic that is not just about the industry. It's about, it, it is, but it's above all a type of power, a type of power structure. So the problem is not, is not only that, that it's male dominated, that it's lopsided in that way. And there is this systemic Sexism, that's just one small piece in the puzzle. The issue is this industry is all about figuring out how to obtain more and more power, not just how to make more and more money. There is a money power nexus here uh, that, that has to do with the a techno a technologic embedded in hegemonic masculinity. Now, the solution, as Chan seems to suggest at the very end, I would argue that it's not just simply about putting the women question at the center of Silicon Valley, not even putting the women question at the top of Silicon Valley. It's not about diversifying power in that way. That is, it's not really, it's not about gen, what is called gender mainstreaming and i'll say a little bit about gender mainstreaming because oftentimes this is thought as the solution of the, uh, the problem of men in power and the problem of men in power is not only the men that most men are in position of power and there are very few women or less women in position of power the problem the problem is a type of power rationality that is masculine, masculinist from the beginning of times. That is the issue. And that type of power structure permeates everything. And by changing the actors, you won't be changing the logic necessarily. Yeah. So in here you have basically the definition of gender mainstreaming, right? And it, it's part of CSR, uh, CSR um, um, logic, what is called corporate social responsibility. Uh, and it's basically the professionalization of, of, the, of diversity. And you can think about this, not only about gender, but with uh, race too. Basically, mostly about gender and race. Uh, and, and it's really, and it's, it's become an industry. It's become uh, a series of consultants 
that go into uh, different economic and political institutions and give advice uh, regarding how to best diversify their uh, leadership at the top. And then from that uh, diversification program is supposed to trickle down into the rest of the company. And that is supposed to be an example for the rest of society. And the main problem here is that basically that type of approach, that type of approach is a technical approach. It's a technocratic approach that doesn't really address the structural uh, critique that feminism, especially feminist theory does of the issue of not having women in position of power, right? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go a little faster because I'm running out of time. Uh, but then if you just read this definition in there, um, it, I think it's basically self-explanatory, right? And an example of this kind of gender mainstreaming, of, it's precisely Sheryl Sandberg's um, um, CEO of Facebook and her idea of leaning feminism, right? which is basically the idea women has to make themselves visible in position of power by the, using the metaphor of leaning in. You have to leaning in when you speak, make sure that your voice is projected. It's kind of a, a motivational mantra that looks at um, this structural problem through a very individualistic, simplistic view. Right? Um, so, um, Really, I will be finishing the lecture by thinking um, about the really the ultimate consequence of this hegemonic masculinity, this new hegemonic masculinity of the of of, of the Mark Zuckerbergs and and, and the Be Bezos and, and this geek um, entrepreneurs, right? The, the the ultimate consequence is when that. Uh, and symbolically, when you watch the, the social network, is that women are invisible in the film. Uh, and invisible in the sense that they have not, not only their flat characters, uh, but they're simply accessories uh, to male power and to, to, to all these different male characters, right? So that's why feminist theory, and, and because we have, like we said before, really the social network is it's, it's, it's really an entry point to understand a male power structure. That it's very telling that women are represented in this way. And feminist theory, we reverse engineer uh, this male power structure. Feminist theory will allow, will allow us to understand how by putting gender in the middle, we can relocate this male power structure. We can think of how these male power structures who are not explicitly male, but they're implicitly masculinist, they're implicitly hegemonic in that they don't have to say power belongs to men in that simply it's assumed and visualized that power is belong, but power belong to men. And, and in that sense, that that is the norm. And it's simply not even questioned. That um, feminist theory will kind of turn that on his, on his head and will look at that, at that male power structure and question its rationality. And I think a final example to think about this is precisely making a parallel to uh, rational economic behavior because it works within the same type of uh, power structure, right? The same type of masculinist power structure. And the very, the very idea of rationality, uh, it's directly connected in both worlds in rational economic behavior and or rational economic theory and everything that we've said, that I've said so far uh, about this technologic. So I'll end with this and I'll present the questions to you.
I'm Jayati Ghosh. I'm an economist and I've been very concerned with issues of how gender affects the economy. The ways in which we define gender relations affects production, consumption, distribution, how states deal with us and how we as citizens should be responding to state policies. You absolutely cannot understand the economy without understanding gender and there are many ways in which things that otherwise appear inexplicable become perfectly understandable once you realize the different roles played by men and women and once you realize what society expects women to do in the form of unpaid labor it makes such a huge difference to the ways in which economies are currently organized and how do we change economic policy to make it less oppressive in ways that we don't even realize gender differences play a role which is not physiologically determined not biologically determined but are socially determined in ways that often disadvantage women economists have got lots of things wrong about many things including gender but when you think about how the lack of understanding of specific roles played by women in the economy have governed mainstream economics for hundreds of years now one of the most obvious is in the very notion of rational economic man it's the idea that every individual is out to maximize his utility in ways that advance material incomes and utility is derived from more of these material incomes is what then drives practically all the basic microeconomic models this ignores the huge role that is played by the care economy and by women largely responsible for care across the world who do not necessarily operate according to this criteria and if you try and explain care you cannot explain it with the notions of rational economic behavior because it is not necessarily rational and it's not even true to say that women derive utility from looking after others because only some of it is because they derive utility a lot of it has to do with the way societies allocate these responsibilities so in terms of standard microeconomics the very methodological basis is undermined once you recognize the existence of unpaid care work you really have to see how this particular gender construction of societies affects all economic processes microeconomics macroeconomics growth theory international trade migration so many things are affected by the difference of work allocation that societies create you know market it's basically reflect the society that they are constructed in markets cannot be this ideal type which is often presented in the textbooks but very much reflect the existing power imbalances in society and therefore if they are not regulated adequately they will amplify them accentuate them and create further divisions how much is influenced by the fact that women are the ones responsible for doing care activities how much is determined by the fact that women in general tend to have less access to different markets or have fewer assets or less incomes available to them it's important to have more and more people aware of these issues because if we don't raise our voice about these things we're never going to be able to change either economics or economic policy okay so to sum up really gender is to economic logic gender here in this video that we that we watch is to economic logic what feminist theory in this lecture is to techno logic and hegemonic masculinity so just give it a think and think how both uh can be compared how the same logic applies to two different um approaches to power okay so in here, you have the questions for the tutorial. So reflect on these questions and discuss them um, in, the, in the tutorial.